Hello everybody and welcome along on the eve of the local and European elections in Ireland here and I'm delighted to welcome Barrister and Senior Counsel Una McGurk. Hello Una, how are you? Hello Stephen. Uh, well, I'm great, but a little bit exhausted, which I'm sure you are yourself at this stage of the, the campaign trail. Well, I am. I'm exhausted running in local elections here, just in my local electoral area of Castlebar, whereas you're covering 10 counties. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's a real, it's a marathon, all right, for sure. Some but going, uh, yeah. fantastic experience. So just to say hello to all your fans down in Ken Mary. You have a lot of fans down here and hopefully they're now my fans as well. Fantastic. If they're and listening you, tonight. Yeah, yeah and, and I'm sure you have fans all over the country because you've been speaking out for, for quite a while on different things. And mm -hmm. um, I was I was just thinking there before you, we, before we started, it's unusual for someone in a position like yours, like a, like a barrister or senior counsel to be outspoken mm -hmm. and, and go against the grain and speak out against government policy like you know and it's not just maybe you'll just give us a little brief history of yourself you know i know you were outspoken during COVID, and yeah to do with something a lot of the things that were going on there the, the restrictions and everything yeah. but would you like for people that maybe don't know you and just to, yeah. to let, let people know that you are you're running in the um ireland south eu parliament That's election correct. yes yeah so it's so, essentially the monster area there are 10 counties mainly monster and i'm running for the european elections yeah that's it excellent now just to let people know we were meant to be also joined by another barrister another senior counsel tonight mm -hmm. edmund um edmund shanahan who's running in the local elections in the kimmage rat mines local electoral area unfortunately we had some technical issues so but we'll talk mm -hmm. to ed again we'll see how he gets on tomorrow and we wish him all the best yeah hopefully yeah, indeed. Yeah. I, I want to give a shout out to Ed as well. I wish him the very best of luck. He's a lovely guy. It's a pity he couldn't join us this evening. It would have been made for a very lively discussion, but maybe we'll do it another time. Yeah, OK, good stuff. Now, I mainly want to talk about the situation with our immigration policy here in Ireland, which you've been very yeah. outspoken about over the last couple of mm -hmm. weeks and months. Um, but just yeah. for people that maybe don't know you, um, yeah. a little brief history about yourself, Una, would be great if you wouldn't mind. Okay, so no problem. Well, I've been around for a, a long, long, long time and I, I became a barrister a long time ago and worked in the system. I have a lot of experience. I worked in civil law, criminal law. I chaired a number of quasi-judicial tribunals in the areas of refugee law, hepatitis C, compensation tribunals, um, a, um, in employment law. I hope I don't mind. Can you see those banners going across the screen? Sorry, they're very distracting. Is that okay for you? I can't you know? see anything going across that's the screen. Perfect. No. It's only they're going across my my screen. So that's fine. So I worked, um, as I said, chairing quasi-judicial tribunals in a number of areas like refugee law, mental health law, employment law, and um, hepatitis C compensation tribunals. I was also appointed by the government on a number of forums like the Forum for Europe, the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation, which predated the Good Friday Agreement. I'm a former national chairperson of the Irish Society of the Red Cross. I was the youngest in the world at the time. And, you know, I have a basic degree in history, in classical civilization and psychology. I have an executive master's in geopolitics. I went to Switzerland to study um, diplomacy and international relations. So, you know, I have a very broad based experience in a lot of different areas. That's just some of the things that come to mind that I don't want to go on about what, well, I was the first female pro, um, female who was appointed as a state prosecutor. I was the first uh, female barrister to prosecute a rape trial before a jury. So I've had a lot of firsts in my day. So I've had a lot of experience and I suppose on that basis, because I was a barrister and a senior counsel and I worked, I moved away from private practice. I had practiced as a barrister, as an advocate in the courts for many years, but I actually wanted to get into the policy area uh, to understand how and why uh, our laws are passed and the effect of them, especially with regard to the area of migration which is uh, and immigration as well, which is very interesting, but I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, Anyway, uh, so I, I, um, so where was I? 
So uh, anyway, at the time that I probably came to prominence for maybe all the wrong reasons, which was in 2020, I was up actually operating as a, uh, you know, in a quasi-judicial position uh, in, in two tribunals. One was a mental health tribunal and the other was the International Protection Appeals Tribunal, which dealt with appeals by asylum seekers who were looking for refugee status. So it was the second stage process for people going through the asylum system. So I did work in the system. So obviously I had a lot of knowledge about a particular area of the system, but my role was that of a legal adjudicator in a in a very small section of the system. So I didn't deal with immigration per se. That was something that was dealt with by the aliens office of the um, Department of Justice. I say this because many people mix up the areas and they conflate the issue, the issues and areas relating to um, international protection and then illegal immigration. And they are actually slightly different. But in 2020, then when COVID came and because of the work I had done and the research I had done, especially when I went to Switzerland, I went down a lot of rabbit holes and uh, where I realized that things were not what they seem. History is not what we have been taught in schools and uh, that it's very, very important to ask questions. I was always somebody who asked questions. I was always that little girl who saw that the emperor had no clothes. That was always me, even in the legal profession. I was just one of those people. I just didn't follow the herd, never did. It's just not in my nature. But I knew that things were very, very wrong with the uh, when when COVID the COVID pandemic was declared, and uh, so I said, mm -mm, "This is not what it seems." Uh, I didn't believe a word that came out of the mouths of the government or any of the ministers. I knew that we were being scammed and deceived as a people. So basically, what I did was uh, I started my own YouTube channel, and I did my I think my first video was on five G. And then I got involved with a lot of people who you might consider would be in the so-called truther movement because they were questioning the establishment and questioning the narrative. And I found it extraordinary, as Stephen, and I still do, that none of my other colleagues came out and questioned the narrative in the way that I did. I, I find that extraordinary. I still can't get my head around it. I know Tracy O'Mahony was very um, vocal at that time, but Tracy works in private industry and she's not a practicing barrister, but most, none of the practicing barristers really, or solicitors with very few exceptions, perhaps maybe lawyers for justice, but none of them came out to question the narrative except me. So it's a very lonely place and space when you're the only one who's actually questioning it. So to make a long story short, I did a number of videos, uh, et cetera. And then I was asked to speak at a rally in 2020. And I was asked specifically to speak on the issue of the wearing of masks. And I was just asked to speak for five minutes on this. So I did my research. And of course, I was quite satisfied that uh, mandatory, the mandatory wearing of masks was not only uh, a useless exercise for the people who would have been required to wear them, but in fact, it could potentially be very damaging for people. And I'm quite satisfied that that is the case. I was also very worried about the fact that it was coming down the line for children in schools and Prof uh, Professor Luke O'Neill was pushing it at that time. And we now know from independent studies that have been conducted since that, in fact, it, they were useless, as I had said, and they were, in fact, damaging and that they, uh, there is evidence that they may in fact have affected the cognitive ability of children in schools who are required to wear them. So it's outrageous. And I recently spoke to a dentist actually about this who also advocated against the wearing of masks and uh, was very vocal in his protestations about wearing them. And from his perspective, he, he was quite satisfied from his research that for a child to have to wear a mask for any period of time would be very damaging to the development of their facial uh, bone structure and their muscles and especially around their mandibular joint and could cause them a lot of serious problems in the future with regard to their teeth. So I'm just bringing that issue up now. And that's something that many people may not be aware of. So I spoke out against this many issues. I also spoke out against the flawed PCR test, which should never have been used. And it was used by this government and other governments 
to lock down the country. I mean, it was outrageous. The basis of the lockdowns was a flawed PCR test. And not only did the man who invented the test, um, Harry Mullis was his name, he was a, a, a he, he was a Nobel laureate and he mysteriously died just a few months before COVID came out. But I have seen him on video many times saying that this is not an appropriate test to be used on its own to test infections. Not even that, even insofar as it could be used at all, it's very important that you wouldn't use it for, it, it's, it, it's based on magnification cycles, that you cannot use it for magnification cycles in excess of 25. In mm -hmm. Ireland, they were using magnification cycles of 45, which mm. basically meant that the results, most of the results were in fact false positives. And it would mean, for example, that a piece of debris that showed up on a test could mean you had a cold 10 years ago. So many people, you know, were locked down and isolated in their homes, et cetera, et cetera, over a completely uh, false, uh, flawed PCR test. So I spoke out about those issues and clearly, the establishment didn't like it. In a nutshell, I was cancelled by the political establishment and I was censored by mainstream media. They wrote nasty articles about me, said I was a conspiracy theorist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. The spokespersons of all the main political parties came out, said I was talking things like dangerous nonsense, which was which in itself was dangerous nonsense because I'm very experienced. I have many qualifications in alternative medicine. I'm a qualified holistic dietitian. I'd spent years doing medical negligence cases as a barrister. So I was very, very experienced with regard to medical negligence and, and the law relating to, to medicine and the practice of medicine, et cetera. And just generally, I knew a lot about that area, more so than the people who are calling me out, shall we say. Even yeah. though, yes, I wasn't a qualified doctor, but I do feel that you don't have to be qualified in every area in order to have an opinion about it. It's called free speech. It's called freedom of expression. You're entitled to have your opinion. Other people are entitled to have their opinion as well. But of course, there was no other platform for people like me in 2020, as you know. So the only platform for me was somewhere like um, that rally where I was asked to speak with others. So that yeah. was the beginning to the end of my career. They basically, mm. I basically lost my career in a nutshell mm. and my income at that time. That's absolutely crazy. And look, at, we yeah. could talk a lot more about that. I, I will just direct people to a great interview yeah. you did with the scholar Gypsy. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. Which I, which I watched a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago there and it's fantastic you go into a lot more detail there and people can learn a lot more about everything you've just said there and about your yeah, history you. and how you got to where you where you are now um but just to move on because i know we've only we've only got a half an hour with you because you're quite busy obviously um i'd like to talk about the immigration but first of all i just like to you know commend you on everything you've done like because you know you've had so much to lose like you just told us you, you've lost everything and you just wanted to speak out and you knew something was wrong and you just yeah, exactly. felt the obligation to speak out and and yeah you're dead right about your your profession I mean you've yeah. mentioned Tr Tracy there um one other one other person I'll just mention a junior barrister who actually came on our show um Martin Byrne is his name a lovely man um I, I actually started the the Irish inquiry on the fourth of the fourth, twenty twenty, just to kind oh. of push back on some of the propaganda that was coming out about this COVID thing. Like straight away, it just didn't seem right to me, um, yeah. and there were a lot of other opinions that weren't getting any sort of mainstream coverage. Um, and it was brilliant to come across um, the likes of uh, Tracy and Martin and yourself. So that was brilliant and well done. It's it's fantastic. So I yes, and, and I'm glad you mentioned Martin. I forgot about him. He was very active at that time, and he did come out. Fair play to him, indeed. And another one, of course, was Ed Shanahan. Even though Ed was more quiet, he was working away diligently in the background. And it would would have been great to have had him on the show, but obviously there was a, there's that technical hitch, and he couldn't make it. But yes, yeah. I want to give a shout out to him. And indeed, there are some colleagues of mine who reached out to me privately and they would be on board. But but you, they saw what happened to me. And I think that's why yeah. they made an example of me, which yeah. is terrible. But I don't regret it. Despite what happened, I have no regrets, Stephen. I did the right thing because like you and so many others probably listening to this show, I stand for truth and justice. Mm -hmm. If you can't stand for those things, you know, and speak your truth. What's the point in living? I yeah. mean, it's just, I, I couldn't conceive of any other way. And this government were deceiving the Irish people. And I just said, 
I can't just sit back and pretend it's not happening. I had to get up and speak about it. And I did that. And I'm, I have no regrets that I did. I'm very glad I did, in fact. Yeah, fair play. Absolutely brilliant. Now, let, let's move on to the immigration because we don't have much time. And you've been yeah. putting out a lot, a lot of video content recently. Uh, and I'd just like to ask you about a few of the things you've said, because um, I've been saying some of these things now, obviously, for the last two years. I'm based in Brafy here. They've doubled the population of our village with refugees and asylum seekers just in the hotel down the road. Um, but um, and people are are beginning to to realize how serious this this problem is. But you're a barrister now, so your words carry much more weight. Um, in your recent video, you mentioned that 560 asylum applicants are arriving every week into Ireland, and this you say mm -hmm. that this is. Uh, unsustainable and will lead to chaos if not stopped so mm. ju just tell us how how do you see like what what sort of chaos are, are we in store for like what what how is well it's how, difficult how bad could this get? Where, well where are are we going to keep them where are we going to house these people 560 people coming in every week where are they going to go i mean we saw the tents outside man street and in other places I mean, this is outrageous that, it, I mean, it's inhuman even that people should ha be having to sleep in those conditions. But yeah. there's so many things wrong with the system. I almost don't know where to start. Like, first of all, you have the eight tweets sent out by M M Minister O'Gorman in, in uh, sorry, the, the tweets in eight different languages sent out yeah. by Minister O'Gorman uh, talking about um, our asylum, you know, uh, the, the system and uh, the reforms that were being made in the system. and. Uh, the prospect of own door accommodation. Now, I, as I said in one of my videos, we may never know how many came here on foot of that, but I think it's inevitable that some, it may be all of the asylum seekers that are coming to Ireland have come because of those tweets. I just think that was an extraordinary, neg an extraordinarily negligent thing for a government minister to do when we were already overburdened with asylum seekers. I mean, why do that? It's yeah. absolutely bizarre, bizarre, bizarre beyond belief. And and I made the point that maybe many of those who were initially, you know, outside the IPO office in Mount Street, living in tents with no sanitary facilities. I mean, this is just shocking and shouldn't happen. So I feel that many people may have come to Ireland under false pretenses, but that is that is just one issue. There's so many issues. That's just one of them. The other one is this, my concern, and I know it's the concern of many other people as well, that the other minister involved, the Minister for Justice, Helen McEntee, was not applying the law under the Immigration Act of 2004 for people who came in without IDs or passports. So yeah. they weren't being prosecuted under that act. Now, the situation might have been fine years and years ago because, you know, there were not so many coming in in terms of numbers. But once the numbers increased, they should have started to use that act because the problem is when these people come in, having destroyed their passports and their IDs, whether they give them back to the agents who brought them in or they flush them down the toilets in the um, airplanes, uh, all they have to do is ring back and say, you know, yeah, I made it through. No problem. Got in. I'm, I'm making my way up to the IPO office now to get my temporary registration certificate so I can go in and get my public services card, which is in effect a de facto identity card. And Bob's your uncle. You know, I'm in the system. And and if it is, if he or she has been here since last September, they can even vote in the local elections. I mean, that's something, isn't it? Let me let me so, ask you about that. Let me ask you about that yeah. for one second, because uh, obviously I'm running yeah. in the local elections here in the Casabar yeah. local electoral area. Now, I applied, or I received the supplementary electoral uh, register yesterday um, for the for Brafie and Castlebar urban and rural areas, which is a, a fraction of the, the full Castlebar LEA. And within that, I counted 511 asylum seekers and refugees, all foreign names, and many of whom from, as I say, the hotel down behind me here, from the uh, iPass Centre in the in the retail park inside Castle Bar there. And many of these people could have just arrived in the last couple of weeks and months. Now, people are still shocked that this, this is allowed. Now, I believe it's been, you know, on the books, this has been a legal thing for... Uh, couple of decades now but it's it's only a big problem now when we have so many people coming in uh, in such a short period of time coming up to an election 
is this can this is this legal or can this be challenged in the courts? Because I know that there are specific uh, councillors in my area that are very involved, let's say, in the Castlebar tidy towns, would who would have a lot of these um, a lot of these asylum seekers, many of whom are African, out picking up our rubbish on a Saturday because they're giving these people a sense of purpose. <laughs> and so they say, um, and they're canvassing in these IPAS centres. They're canvassing for these foreign votes. Um, you can be damn sure that these IPAS residents and, and refugees won't be voting for the likes of me because I'm hi highlighting some of the problems. So, I mean, yeah. is, is it, can this be challenged, do you think, in the courts? Well, like, is this interfering I mean, with elections? Well, most things can be challenged, of course, and I do think it should be challenged. But um, it's not. It's only those who have been here since last September, those who are resident in the country uh, as far back as last September, the 1st of September of last year. So it, it, those who've just arrived in the last few weeks or months won't be eligible. But I personally do not agree with it. I do not think that somebody who has come into this country uh, in circumstances where you may not even know who they are, this is where it gets very complicated because if somebody comes in without a passport or an ID and they make their way to the IPO office and and they apply for this temporary registration certificate so that they then can get a public services card, what they do is they give they have to give an account of their history to the I, to the officer in the IPO center. So the officer there has to take their word has to, has to take them at face value so if they say they're from country x you know the the ipo officer will accept that i mean they don't it's not the fault of the ipo officer i'm not suggesting that it's the fault of the system mm -hmm. but they may not be from country x at all they may be from country y mm -hmm. and in addition to that they may have a criminal record Mm -hmm. And we don't know, because we don't know who they are, where they've come from, their date of birth, there is no database whereby the, the, they can be accessed. And there, a suggestion was made by the minister in the Doyle that the Eurodax system is used for that purpose. And it's not. The Eurodax system is only used to determine if somebody has actually passed through another EU member state on their way to Ireland, mm -hmm. which is a different thing also, altogether. It's not used to determine uh you know somebody's criminal record so you the problem is you have the I'm not, I'm not saying this with every single asylum seeker because of course there may be genuine asylum seekers right. amongst the group and and we have to be careful about that and mindful of that but the problem is that many of them may not be genuine many of them may be economic migrants they may be taking the opportunity to come here to change their identity to clear their past you know, uh, make a new life for themselves. And the bottom line is, if they've been in the country since the 1st of September last year, and they're still going through the system whereby their, their application is being processed, they now have the right to vote for you. They can't actually vote for me because they're only supposed to vote in the local elections. Yeah. But I think this is very, very wrong. Why should people like that, especially people when we don't know anything about them, have the um, opportunity and why should they be given the power to potentially change the political landscape of this country? I think it's outrageous, quite frankly, and I certainly don't support it. I, I really think yeah. it's very wrong. I mean, even with regard to the Ukrainians, I know now there's 2,000 Ukrainians in Killarney and there's a Ukrainian candidate running for the the local elections. So there's enough Ukrainians there to vote for that person in. And a lot of locals are not happy about this mm -hmm. at all. I, yeah, and absolutely. I, and I don't blame them. I mean, these people know nothing about our country, about our culture, uh, about anything about us. And why should they be given the authority and the power to make any kind of a determination with regard to who gets in to our system of governance? Yeah. Very, very wrong, and I don't support it at all. And I think it's outrageous, quite frankly. That's my own view. But, yeah. but also today, I came across a situation that concerns me, and I don't know. Uh, hopefully, uh, nothing will come of this. But, but I, I'm apparently a number of Ukrainians have been posting online uh, and telling their supporters that who to vote for in the European elections. And they've actually set out 
the list of candidates to be voted upon in each of the three constituencies. And all of the candidates, of course, are establishment, current party political candidates. Now, that I find that disturbing that somebody who came here uh, ostensibly from a war, uh, you know, and they're getting refuge in this country, and now so they feel entitled to interfere in the electoral process of that country and to make decisions and determinations about who gets elected and who doesn't. Again, I think that's completely unacceptable and outrageous. But what's even more disturbing about that is that Ukrainians do not have a vote in our European elections, because in order to have a vote in the European election, you have to either be an Irish citizen or a U European citizen. So they have no vote. So is there something going on here that we need to know about? Wow. Why is this happening? How, in fact, at the polling booth tomorrow, will the polling officers be able to distinguish between those who are, um, you know, asylum seekers or and those who are genuine members of the EU in order to determine how many ballot papers to give them? I don't know what checks and balances have been put in place. I haven't had a chance to investigate it, but I will investigate it. I sincerely hope that there are proper and appropriate checks and balances in place to ensure that there's no mix up and that the polling officers handing out the documents will be in a position to know exactly who's who and who is entitled to vote in what election. Are you with me? Yeah. Because only people who are yeah. Irish citizens or EU citizens can vote in the European Parliament. And those who um, have been here since the 1st of uh, September of last year can vote in the local elections. Right. Yeah. Well, um, no better woman to investigate uh, that in time. So I, I look forward to hearing more about that. We'll have to see yeah. what, what happens well, in the hopefully meantime. They're, they're, hopefully everything's OK and the systems and the checks and balances are there. But it's something yeah. that we need to be mindful of. Yeah. For sure. Now, look, at it's it's 20 to 8. I know I've only got, you know, until a quarter. I've got a load of questions. I'm only going to... Oh, yeah, have, sorry. I, I, can do, I can do another 10 minutes. Sorry, yes. Right. You want to ask well, me about... Yeah. Well, I want to just ask you, look, we know the problems. Like, I've, I've been highlighting the problems myself for a long time. We've let so many people into the country and there's so many knock-on effects. Like, I mean, we know the pro problems with housing, with services, yeah. resources, with policing, yeah. with, with integration uh, for all these people. Like, there's so many problems yeah. and people are exactly. very worried. And we don't so, have the structures to cope with the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So, look, yeah. Is there, I know you've done a, a video recently. How do we address this? Is there any hope that we can... There is. I have a five-form plan and I'll, yes. yeah, and I'll explain Please. that to you. And one of the issues, and I know you will be very familiar with this, is the I-Pass centres are being set up all over the country against mm. the will of the people without consulting with the people. They're being set up mainly in working class areas and in rural communities, away from the smart, smarter areas of you know, or urban areas and places like Dublin 4 and 6, and Dorky, where all the professionals live. So that many of them don't even realize what's happening. But if these numbers com continue at this pace, eventually they will have to move these centers into Dublin 4 and 6 and Dorky. Uh, but, by, but by the time people waken up, then it's going to be too late. And therein lies the problem. So um, I've been working with a lot of people on the ground and supporting people and giving my support to people in places like Clonmel and in Newtown and Kennedy, where they have borne the brunt of this enforcement policy by the government. And it's effectively being enforced by one minister, and that is Rodrigo Gorman. And what he's doing is that in designating places as I-pass centres, he has obligations under the law. And it's a particular statutory instrument, statutory instrument number 230 of 2018. And he's supposed to carry out a risk assessment to deal with issues like public interest and public order. That's not being done and they're not consulting with the local people and they're putting these centres in against the will of the people. And this is such a dangerous precedent to set. To set. We saw what happened in Newtown and Kennedy. Like this is just dreadful, should never have happened. We don't want it to happen again, but it will continue to happen if this minister continues to flout the law and not consult with the people. So it's unsustainable. So basically what I have suggested really was a five point plan to deal with this issue. And the, the first one is to speed up the execution of deportation orders. When somebody goes through the system 
and they they lose they fail to prove that they're entitled to have refugee status eventually a deportation order will be issued but we've been very lax about that because it's usually self deportation and also there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that even people against whom deportation orders have been issued simply don't leave the country they're somehow floating around in the system so we need to speed up that process we need to ensure that this government and in particular the iraqis do not vote in the eu asylum and migration pact because by doing so we will lose our sovereignty and it will mean that with regard to one of the uh, legislative measures in particular it's the migration management pact we will be giving our power to an unelected body the EU, EU, eu commission to determine how many relocated asylum seekers we can have in this country so if uh, countries under migratory pressure for example like italy because they usually have to deal with the the burden of the asylum seekers coming across the mediterranean they can apply to the european commission they can say look at we've got too many can you spread these people around so what will happen is that ireland will maybe get more than their fair share because it's based on gdp and we have an artificially high gdp because of the multinationals here but the bottom line is we will have no control over those those numbers and if we refuse to take those relocations as designated by uh, brussels we will have to pay 30000 per year per asylum seeker ad infinitum and if we're in breach of that we'll be taken to the european court for infringement proceedings but the bottom line is this we will lose our sovereignty uh, in this area so it's crucial that we don't do that the other um issue that i mentioned um i had um five points uh yes is the immigration act it's very important that the um the government and the minister for justice in particular starts to uh apply you know, starts to enforce or ensure rather prosecutions under the immigration act simply for the purpose of it acting as a deterrent now i know that there have been some prosecutions this year apparently about 100 but that's not really enough because we know that about 85% of those coming into the country are coming in without passport or id and then the main one that i want to deal with which is really really important is to um request and i have done this in my videos is to request that ireland through its government join forces with the 15 and growing other eu member states who are now calling on the eu to have an external processing system which would mean that the processing of asylum seekers would take place in another country another safe country now obviously one where the proper human rights standards would apply and the geneva conventions would apply and the non refoulement uh, concept would apply so it's very important that that it's done uh, justly and properly and fairly but it could be done in another country to a large extent this is what they're doing with the uk with the Ro Ro rwanda scheme and we know it's already working and very effective because many asylum seekers are not actually going to the uk anymore or illegal Im immigrants are not going to the uk they're in fact coming here so we're mm -hmm. paying the price for that so i think it's really important that we have this system because our own system is simply unsustainable because because we won't be able to keep the numbers and it's going to have a hugely disruptive effect on communities as you say we don't have this infrastructure the schools are overburdened the medical system is overburdened we will have too many immigrants of faith of particular faiths who do not and will not and will never integrate with us so yeah. this is all about the dilution of our culture our history and our language we are an indigenous people, we are an ancient peoples, and we should be protected. I mean, it's arguable that we actually should be protected as an indigenous people under the UN Charter. And instead, this government seems intent on diluting every aspect of what is Irish. Um, you know, and, and I am very unhappy about that. I do not support it. I don't like it. We didn't vote for this. You didn't vote for it. Anybody I ask didn't vote for it. So this isn't about being a humanitarian. You know, we can all be humanitarians. I am a humanitarian to my core. And if somebody comes here and they genuinely need asylum and they need refuge, I am all in favor of that. The problem is that most people who do come are coming for a better life. You can't blame them. Many of them are innocents, but what's happening is they're coming with agents and it's become a giant 
human trafficking scheme. It's now a big business. It's a global multinational business. It's at that at a global level, but unfortunately, it's also that now at a national level, because so many Irish people who have properties and who are landlords and who have lodges and hotels are benefiting financially. So the incentives yeah. are there for a certain class of Irish people to to have this system in place. And this in itself is also causing problems. So I just think it would be better for everybody if you had this externalized system. Yeah. Then it would be more fair. Now, of course, there will be opposition to it because a lot of the NGOs who are, you know, uh, you know, getting paid to promote this system and a lot of the landlords who are benefiting from it won't like it because they're going to see their incomes diminished. But ultimately, I'm just saying that's tough because it's not good for Ireland and it's not good overall for our communities and for the Irish people. And I think anybody who takes a step back to look at that will realise it, Stephen. Yeah, brilliant. You've raised some great points there, Una, and I will also put the link to your video in the description of this video so people can can watch that. Um, now, that they're all great points and all, uh, but I would imagine that we're not going to get anywhere with them uh, when we have the current government in power. Like they, they may, they may act as if they're going to take steps towards some of these yeah. uh, as we get mm -hmm. closer to a general election, but inevitably we can be sure that they won't. Um, so with that in mind, I mean, I wish you the very best with your campaign. You. Um, but Thank in you. the case that you do not get in, I would really hope to see you running um, in the general election because we really need some great people like yourself in there with uh, courage and integrity to stand up and act in the best interests of the people. So I really hope you're going to consider that, but we won't consider that just yet because let's see what yes. happens tomorrow. Thank you so much. And may I say the same to you. I wish you every success in the election tomorrow. I'm quite sure you will make it. And not only that you'll make it, but you'll do really well and nobody deserves it better than you. So, and thank you for having me on this evening. I'm sorry, I'm probably a bit tired. I just hope that uh, you and your listeners got some value out of what I've said. But if you share my video, especially the last one where I dealt with the five points, I'm yeah. not sure. I think I may have missed out one, but um, they'll get the gist. But I, I've given the um, the most important points anyway, which is, is and the last one was, was really the most important point. But we have yeah. to do something because what's happening, Stephen, is unsustainable. And I've seen it. I've been around the country. I've been around the constituency. People are angry. People are fearful. Mm -hmm. This is not the Ireland I grew up in. And I'm deeply saddened by what's happened to my country. And, you know, I'll go as far as I can. I'm determined to fight for the Irish people on this issue, whether it's in Europe or in Ireland. I'm going to continue the fight, that's for sure. And I know you will too. Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant talking to you, Una. Thanks so much and the yeah. very best. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. Same to you. God bless and, and uh, good night to all your listeners. Thank you. Take, take care.